Hello and welcome to today's session. Today we're going to be talking about the dietary management of, of irritable bowel syndrome and we're going to be specifically looking at the low FODMAP diet. But before we begin, a few introductions. My name's Leah Seamark. I'm Kerry Marchant. And I'm Marianne Williams and we're all specialist gastroenterology dietitians working for Somerset Partnership NHS Foundation Trust in the southwest of the UK. So before we go into detail about the low FODMAP diet, it's really important that anyone who has been diagnosed with IBS, if they're considering trying the low FODMAP diet, they should have tried the first line IBS dietary advice first. And this is covered in one of our previous webinars, which you can find on our website, www.patientwebinars.co.uk. And this webinar looks at basic lifestyle advice, which we know can help with irritable bowel syndrome. So that's things like trying to follow a regular meal pattern, taking time to sit down at a table to eat your meals, making your meals a digital free zone. It also looks at reducing some of those known irritants to the gut. So it looks at moderating your intake of spicy foods, high fat foods, reducing your intake of caffeine and alcohol. If you've tried that advice, we also talk about trialing a two week period of a low lactose diet or a fructan free diet. And then we touch on trying the low FODMAP diet. And today we're going to be talking about that low FODMAP diet in a lot more detail. So what we're going to cover today on the low FODMAP diet. So we're going to consider what to do before embarking on the low FODMAP diet who should use it, what the low FODMAP diet is, how do you follow this diet, what are the high FODMAP foods, is it useful if you're constipated, how does this diet affect your gut bacteria, help with following this low FODMAP diet and what to do if it doesn't work. So a few housekeeping slides before we get started. So this webinar is only suitable for those who have been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome or IBS by a medical professional, such as a GP or consultant. Please go and see your GP if you do have any of the following. So blood in your stools, unexplained significant weight loss, unexplained low iron levels, or sudden change in symptoms, or waking at night regularly with your gut symptoms. It's also important before you start any dietary changes to go and have a celiac blood test. Your GP can organise this for you easily. And it's really important to do that, isn't it? Especially before starting the low FODMAP diet, because in order for that celiac blood test to be accurate, you need to be eating things like wheat, barley and rye, which on the low FODMAP diet is something that we will be restricting. That's yeah, correct. so you, you mustn't go on a gluten free diet before you have a celiac blood test. And it is a really simple blood test done by all GP surgeries. Um, you don't need to book to see the GP necessarily. You could just book in to see the phlebotomist if you've already had IBS diagnosed. Um, but definitely the NICE guidelines for the UK suggest you should have a celiac test if you've had IBS symptoms for longer than six months. So what to consider before the low FODMAP diet? So 75% of IBS patients will improve on the low FODMAP diet, but this does mean that 25% patients won't respond well to it. So if your IBS symptoms are associated with stress or anxiety, it may actually be more appropriate to use medication or cognitive behavioural therapy or even hypnotherapy. And that's really important, isn't it? So if you feel that your symptoms are strongly associated with stress or anxiety, it may be that diet might not be the most effective management for you. So there are some other treatment options there you may wish to consider. I think, you know, a few years ago, I don't know what, what you guys feel, but a lot of people were told their IBS was all in their head and it was, um, you know, stress. And we now know that that isn't necessarily the case at all. But there are still, in some cases for some people, that stress is the main factor. And if you think about it, before everybody goes for an exam, they quite often have loose stools and that's the stress hormones kicking in. So to have effects of stress affecting your gut is very normal. Uh, but we now know that for a lot of people, um, diet is, is very related to their symptoms as well. So this diet might actually not be suitable for children or adult patients who have a history of anxiety associated with food or eating disorders, or those suffering with an acute or chronic health condition that already compromises their nutritional status. If you feel this is you, please seek dietetic advice before following the diet. And it may be that when you see a dietitian, if you do present with sort of anxieties associated with food, it kind of may be deemed appropriate that something like the low format diet might not be as appropriate for you. Or if it is, you might need another level of support. And by following this webinar, we will give you all the tools you need to follow the diet. But it is still important that if possible, seek the advice of a dietitian 
um, just to make sure that your diet remains healthy and balanced. Yeah, we wouldn't want people to think that this webinar replaces seeing a dietitian. I think that's really, really important. But we fully understand that there are actually uh, insufficient numbers of us qualified IBS dietitians in the UK and for some people it's very difficult to find somebody um, so we hope that this will help but definitely the advice would be to seek a dietitian's one-to-one um, -one service as well. Okay so we do advise you to watch this webinar a couple of times you know re-watch it as many times as you need to consolidate that knowledge um, you don't have to watch it all in one go you can pause the webinar you can start again you can watch it in sections whatever you prefer However, it is vital that you do watch the webinar in its entirety, even though you may watch it in sections, please make sure you've watched it a few times throughout. I think the, the, the FODMAP diet is not something you can just pick up and, and run with without very much help. And this whole webinar from beginning to end will give you advice. And if you missed any bits of the webinar, you just wouldn't get the whole picture. So it's really important that you do watch it. But as Kerry says, you can quite happily watch it in sections. You don't have to sit down and watch the whole thing at one go. But please do ensure you've, you've watched the whole webinar. And before I hand back over, the, we've got a few handouts you can download. Um, so we've got some on what the low FODMAP fruit and veg are, we've got low fruct and low lactose, the reintroduction, which is really very important, which we'll go into in a bit more detail, and an example of a daily menu just to help you out. And those are all on our website, patientwebinars.co.uk. So please just go to the website to download those handouts whenever you, whenever you feel ready. They'll, they're always there. So who should use the low FODMAP diet? It's very much a diet for those diagnosed with IBS. There is research showing it can be used in other conditions, but predominantly we're talking about uh, it being used for patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, patients with bloating, wind, abdominal pain, gurgling, diarrhea, nausea, reflux, all of these symptoms are very similar. And I always like this picture in particular because it really says what a lot of my patients say. They, so they come and they feel like somebody has pumped them up with a bicycle pump and their bloating is just so extreme and, and very distressing for them as well. Uh, so this is really, I thought it was a great picture for a lot of patients um, explain. In fact, I suffer with IBS myself. I don't know if you two do as well. And that's often what I feel like. I've eaten a whole load of FODMAPs and I feel like my stomach's completely bloated up. Uh, do you two suffer with IBS or not? I think lots of people say that when they mm. eat some sort of FODMAP foods, they feel bloated. But I suppose the issue is when that bloating becomes so uncomfortable that it, it stops them doing Mm. aspects of their daily life so actually it's quite normal sometimes to feel a little bit of bloating after yeah. having sort of a high FODMAP food but the issue is when it those those symptoms start to affect your daily living and they stop you doing things that you would normally do day to day. I think it's a very good point because actually a bit of bloating a bit of wind a bit of these symptoms is actually a sign that your gut's working very yeah, well exactly. so actually it'd be you know quite useful to know that everything's working normally but you, as you say it's when it gets out of control. So what is the low FODMAP diet exactly? Well what the word means, FODMAP, is it stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. Well, that's a hideous long mouthful. So we just shorten it to the first letter of each of those words. And FODMAPs basically are dietary carbohydrates which are poorly absorbed, causing osmotic changes in the small intestine and fermentation by bacteria in the large intestine, which triggers symptoms in sensitive individuals. Now, that all sounds a little bit complicated, so I'll add it. A little bit more detail to that. So one thing I really want to start with before anything else is to say that the FODMAP diet is absolutely nothing to do with allergy. It is the foods that relate to the FODMAP diet have nothing to do with whether you've got an allergy to these foods uh, and therefore allergy testing is absolutely no use whatsoever in IBS. So a lot of people will say to us, oh can I have allergy testing, will that help me with my IBS? Well it's absolutely irrelevant for IBS. The problem occurs that some people may have food allergy which has very similar symptoms to irritable bowel syndrome and for those people allergy testing may be relevant but that's a completely different cohort of people and those people often have a high rate of what we call atopy so things like eczema, asthma, hay fever or other food allergies already in themselves or in the family so those are a very specific group of people but your IBS patients allergy and allergy testing is no use at all. So the diet is more about plumbing and um, you can see the picture of the intestine there why it does actually look like a bit of chaotic plumbing. 
it's about osmosis it's about water moving from one area of the intestine from the body into the small intestine now if you get a lot of water suddenly entering your small intestine that's going to make your stools very liquid and may give you diarrhea um, and that's why a lot of people will end up with loose stools if they eat a lot of FODMAPs. It's also about gut bacteria. So down in our lower intestine live an awful lot of bacteria and they are really, really important for our health. We need those bacteria and they're important for supporting our bodies in every day. But they do also cause wind. They can result in methane and hydrogen being produced and gas coming out. So if you eat an awful lot of certain foods so for instance baked beans would be your classic example everybody knows that beans means farts that's because they produce a lot of wind which the bacteria produce down in the lower intestine this is actually a brilliant video which we would really recommend that you watch uh, it's freely available on youtube and it's produced by Monash University in Australia, who made the, uh, the FODMAP diet in the first place, or created the FODMAP diet and did all the research initially. And it's a fantastic video. So I would really recommend that you watch that. So here's a quick question for all of, the, or all of those of you watching. Why do FODMAPs cause symptoms? Choose two correct answers here in this list. So is it A, because they are the wrong color? Is it B, because they cause water to enter the bowel, leading to loose stools? Is it C, because they are unhealthy? Or is it D, because gut bacteria ferment some FODMAPs, resulting in wind, bloating and pain? So I think, hopefully, you will understand from what we said at the moment, that it is purely down to the physiology of the water moving into the bowel, causing loose stools, and the gut bacteria fermenting. It is nothing to do with the colour or the healthiness. In fact, all the FODMAP foods that we talk about that are high FODMAP are actually very, very healthy foods. It's just that unfortunately in some people they will cause symptoms. So moving on to how do you actually follow the low FODMAP diet? Now, there are a couple of approaches which can be used. So the first approach is the top down approach. And this involves restricting all of the FODMAP foods for a period of four to eight weeks. If after that period you've seen improvements in your symptoms, you can then reintroduce foods back into the diet one at a time to your personal level of tolerance, um, with the emphasis that we're going to kind of be moving towards sort of a personalised, normalised diet for you. So the top down is where you would restrict all of the FODMAP foods in one go for that sh short period. And that's what we normally do in yeah. clinic, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. But there is another approach that can be used, which we often call the bottom up approach which is actually looking at your diet as it is at the moment and reducing a few high FODMAP foods that maybe you eat quite regularly. So it's just taking a few FODMAP foods and specifically reducing them for a period of time. And then if you don't see a huge amount of improvements, you may then add something else. So for example, we saw a patient in clinic recently who ate apples two, three times a day. And as we go through the presentation- And he had apple juice and everything as well, didn't he? And as we go through the presentation, we'll find out that apples is one of those FODMAP foods. So actually what we tried with him was a bottom-up approach where we just restricted his apple intake. And actually that was enough to actually improve his symptoms mm. to a point mm. which he was actually comfortable with. Absolutely. And I've also had people who uh, decided they need to go on a much healthier diet. They're really making healthy changes to their diet. So they'll suddenly, for instance, up their intake of chickpeas or beans or lentils or things like avocado, which are all FODMAP. And then they suddenly get these terrible IBS symptoms. And actually all we need to do is reduce a few of those foods and they're back to normal again. They don't need to do the whole FODMAP diet. So yeah, very much a personalized look, isn't it? Absolutely. The approach that we're actually gonna be talking a little bit about today is the top-down approach where actually you restrict all the FODMAP foods for a period of four to eight weeks, and then we look at reintroducing them back into the diet in a stepwise fashion. So in terms of what those FODMAP foods are, you've got these different um, types of carbohydrates. So you've got your fructans and your galactic Tans, which can be found in things like your, your bread products, um, also in the, some of your vegetables, so your onions and your garlics, and your galactans is what you feel, find in things like your baked beans, your lentils, your pulses, your chickpeas. Polyols, so a sugar which is found in your stone fruit, so your peaches and your plums, your nectarines, as well as in quite a lot of the artificial sweeteners, especially the ones that end in the oles, so things like mannitol, xenitol, sorbitol. You've also got fructose, which is a single sugar, and that can be found in some of your sweet products, so things like honey. 
um, mango and some of your other vegetables are things like your sugar snap peas. And fructose is also a sweetener, which is used in quite a lot of your other kind of sweet products. So things like jams, breakfast cereals, sometimes I'll have fructose syrup added to them. So that's something that we're going to be talking about. And also, um, I wanted to say actually fructose, a lot of people say to me, but isn't fructose in all fruit? But it's not in a high enough quantity for it to be an issue. Um, so that's why we're actually only really highlighting mangoes there. So you don't need to remove all fruit. Yes. And you'll see that more in a list later. And fructose is actually more of an issue when there's more fructose in a product than another sugar called glucose. Because the way our bodies actually absorb, absorb fructose is it almost pee back from the back of glucose. So if you've got more glucose, if you've got more fructose in a product than glucose, it means that something gets left over and that's what gets left over and ferments. That, that makes sense. And the last one that we look at is lactose, which is two sugars stuck together. So lactose is the sugar that you find in animal milks and products made from animal milks, so things like yogurts, cheeses, um, and is found in higher quantities in some sort of your processed and reduced fat cheeses. And we're going to go into the lactose side of things a bit more detail in a minute, yeah. so I'll tell you a bit more about that. And when we look at the low FODMAP diet, the effects of those FODMAP foods are often not down to just one individual food. It's often down to a combination of those foods or the quantities that are eating over sort of a short space of time. And before you kind of decide on whether you're going to try the low FODMAP diet, it's important to recognise that the diet must not be done for any longer than eight weeks. And one of the reasons for that is the evidence suggests that if you follow the low FODMAP diet for a long period of time it can actually reduce the amount of good bacteria in your gut so even if the, you follow the diet and you feel great on it you still need to look at that reintroduction after that eight week period and as i previously mentioned if you do find the diet does lead to improvements in your symptoms it's still really really important that you follow that FODMAP, FODMAP reintroduction process and that involves reintroducing foods back into the diet one at a time to determine your personal threshold for that. And there is a FODMAP reintroduction sheet, isn't there? Yep. So if you go to the website, patientwebinars.co.uk, there's an information sheet which talks about the um, FODMAP reintroduction, and that can be found on the IBS pages of the website. And also, another point to note is that if you try the low FODMAP diet and it leads to no improvement in your symptoms, it's really important that you stop the diet and you then return to your normal eating pattern. We've often had patients come into clinic um, and they've been on the low FODMAP diet for a while and you mm. talk to them about their symptom improvements. And I've had said, people on who've been on it for two years, for instance. And often they say, actually, there wasn't a significant change in the symptoms and they've just not got back to their normal eating pattern. So it's really important that if there are no improvements or significant improvements in your gut symptoms, after following the diet for the eight weeks that you do stop it and return to your normal diet. And I think it really highlights how important it is to get good, accurate advice from dietitians on this diet, because um, the, the, the poor people that have been on this diet for an extended period of time have often just been told to go and look up the FODMAP diet and follow it and haven't got any guidance on the reintroduction. And hence, they're unfortunately on it for a long time. And, and it's not their fault. It's just they were given no guidance and no follow up. So I think it's really important to, to get proper, accurate information. And if you can see a dietitian, but at least get accurate information such as the information we're giving you here today. So a question for those of you watching us today. So what is the maximum amount of time that you should do the low FODMAP diet for before starting the reintroduction process? Is it A, two weeks, B, 30 weeks, C, one year, or D, eight weeks? Now, as we've just said, eight weeks is the maximum amount of time that you should follow that restriction part of the low FODMAP diet for before you start that reintroduction process. Okay, so now I'm going to talk you through some of the high FODMAP foods. Um, so we're going to start with fructans. These are usually found in your wheat, barley and rye. So confused by wheat? I think we all are. So you've got your wheat and what we are going to focus on is this fermentation. This is the IBS plumbing side things, the fructans. We're not talking about a wheat allergy. This would involve the immune system and this is around gluten. We're, again, we're not talking about gluten sensitivity or we're not talking about celiac disease. These are completely different. So we are not following a gluten-free diet. It's really important. Um, but gluten is found in wheat, barley, and rice. So it, we do. We will be using some of these foods, but like I said, it's it's got nothing to do with. It I gets guess. quite confusing for people, does. doesn't it? Because you've got two things in wheat, haven't you? You've got the gluten, which relates to those people with those other conditions, yes. and then you've got the fructans, which is the FODMAP. 
which is a carbohydrate. So gluten is a protein, and that relates to those other conditions. But fructans are a carbohydrate, so a completely different element, and it's the fructans that we're more interested in with the FODMAP. Yes. Would you say that's correct? Yes. So these fructans were poorly absorbed in absolutely everybody. We have no ability to break them down in the small intestine, which is why they cause this fermentation and these IBS symptoms in sensitive individuals. So for IBS, we are looking at fructans in wheat, barley and rye, not the gluten in wheat, barley and rye. It's really important. So the gluten-free foods. So yes, you can use gluten-free foods as these will contain no wheat, barley and rye, therefore containing no fructans. So this will be no normal pasta, pastry, bread, flour, noodles, biscuits, cakes, with the one exception of sourdough spelt bread. So this is not wheat free, but it must be made using 100% spelt flour and must be made using the sourdough method. So interesting enough, the, the spelt still has fructans in it, yes. but it has a much lower level and then if you make it using the sourdough method, I will go into that a little bit more detail later. So that sourdough spelt would be totally unsuitable for those other conditions like celiac disease and gluten sensitivity, etc. Um, but it would be okay on the FODMAP. So Waitrose have a sourdough spelt bread, which you can find if you have a Waitrose. Yeah, bread. it's quite difficult to find it yes. actually. Um, some people will make it themselves. You need a sourdough culture uh, to start off and it's quite easy after that, but it, it's time consuming. So, but to actually find it available in the supermarket. So if anybody uh, finds another supermarket doing 100% spelt sourdough, please do let us know, we'll add it to our list. It's sometimes worth asking at the farmers markets, etc., or mm. specialist bakeries, because sometimes yeah, they might be able to mm. get hold of it as well. Mm. But otherwise on this page, you will see that we have lots of gluten-free examples. We've got gluten-free flours and biscuits and breads. There are lots of different brands out there. If you are keen to make your own, there are lots of gluten-free cookbooks available as well. So it's important what starchy foods you can eat. Let's focus on that for a minute. So rice, all kinds of rice, brown, wild, basmati, long grain, the list goes on. Potato, all white potatoes that could be mashed or boiled, roasted chips. So I yeah. mean, things like new potatoes, old potatoes, any Maris Pipers, mm -hmm. King Edwards, any of them, they're all absolutely fine, aren't they? And we've got oats and oat brands. So if you're having porridge or flapjacks, something like Oaty Bix. Do you need to use gluten-free oats? No, we no. don't. Okay. But then we've got things like buckwheat, polenta, quinoa, or non-wheat cereals. So something like Rice Krispies or cornflakes. Um, and then in brackets, you'll see, do not worry about something called barley malt extract. The quantity is just too small for people in the FODMAP diet to be worried about. It would be for a celiac patient, they wouldn't be able to have that, but the barley malt extract. But I'm right in saying that for FODMAP patients, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, it? absolutely. So if you pick up a pack of Rice Krispies and cornflakes, as Kerry said, they don't have to be gluten free cornflakes or gluten free mm. Rice Krispies, just normal cornflakes and Rice Krispies. And even if they do have barley milk extract in the ingredients list, they're fine as well for a low FODMAP diet. I think the, the problem arises that if you go into the supermarket, you will not find fructan free food. No. But what you will find is gluten free food. So you're piggybacking on the back of the gluten free food, in effect, as a FODMAP patient. So, you know, things that we have to worry about for a celiac where they couldn't have the barley malt extract and they'd have to have gluten free oats, etc. We don't need to worry about that because it's not the gluten we're worried about and those quantities are not significant enough. So here are some more examples of things like the rice and the rice pasta, rice noodles. You've got buckwheat, polenta, millet, just some examples of what you might see in the supermarket. Okay, moving on to the fruit and veg. So in this section, we're going to concentrate on what you can eat with the odd exception. And if you want to see what you can't eat, then download the handout from our website. So fruit, as you can see, there's lots of different fruits here. You've got your pineapples, your grapes, you've got unripe bananas. That's some more greeny yellow ones, not literally yeah. unripe, yeah. Yes. You've got things like your honeydew and your cantaloupe melon, but as you'll see, there's a big cross through the watermelon at the top. And um, there's all your citrus fruits. We've got kiwis, we've got rhubarb, we've got some other unusual ones such as your dragon fruit or your kumquats and maybe some passion fruit and pawpaw and things as well there's quite there's a lot of the fruit yeah. that's fine actually and the great thing is the berries which a lot of people like to use on cereals and things mm. in the morning are all fine so for fruit we would ask you to be eating at least three portions a day and it's important to spread these portions throughout rather than eating them all in one sitting and one portion is around 80 grams or whatever you can fit in your hand 
I'll move on to the vegetables. Again, we've got lots of green leafy ones here. So you've got things like alfalfa, bean sprouts, courgettes. Got all sorts of things like French okay. beans and rocket and the lettuces. Um, spring oh. onions, just the green part only, isn't it? And we take onions out of this, onions and garlic. So I do find the chives mm -hmm. and the green part of the spring onions very useful as an onion replacer. What do you guys use as a, as a garlic replacer? As you can see in this picture here, we often recommend using garlic oil. So freely available in supermarkets. So you can use sort of garlic oil as an alternative to using either powdered or garlic cloves. And things like chili, a lot of people say, oh, I can't have a curry, it really upsets my gut. And what we think is often happening with curries is that they've very uh, got quite a lot of onion and garlic in and that's what's upsetting people. But because the spices is what you taste, you assume it must be the spices, but actually things like chili and most of the herbs and spices are absolutely fine on the FODMAP diet. Yeah, so so I think with the chili, it's just something to play around with, is it? Because as we mm. mentioned before, some people do find spicy food like an irritant to the yeah. gut, but it's, so it'd be interesting for you to try and cook a curry, say, with the low FODMAP ingredients and just kind of play around with the amount of chili that you're able to tolerate. Yeah, absolutely. And just make sure you haven't got any onion and garlic in mm -hmm. there or use the chives and the green parts, spring onions, the garlic oil, etc. Mm -hmm. So you've got your your all your your sort of salad stuff there Kerry haven't you? Yes you've got things like your peppers, your tomatoes, cucumber, lettuce, that's iceberg butter, there's lots of different types of lettuce that are absolutely suitable on the low FODMAP diet. You've also got your root vegetables there haven't you so things like your mm. carrots, uh, parsnips, mm. turnips, sweets are great for kind of soup based products. Yeah so with vegetables we have no upper limit on how many vegetables you can have in one sitting but we'd be encouraging you to have at least two or more portions a day so you can choose one of the following per meal so these are where we are limiting how much you are having so this could be one tablespoon of peas five mange two pods three tablespoons of sweet potato a quarter celery stick less than five brussels sprouts two tablespoons of sweet corn four pieces of sun-dried tomato two tablespoons of butternut squash two tablespoons of broccoli or a quarter of an avocado so these are allowed in small amounts, but just yes. one of them per meal uh, because they are high FODMAP if you have too much of them. Now, Leah said we and um, Marianne said we do not allow any onion or garlic at all. So this is no garlic or onion in flavorings So something like crisps or stock cubes, ready meals, gravy, pasta sauces, soups. The list will go on. Um, it's really important to check the back of packets and check that ingredients list for onion and garlic or for that word flavorings. Again, no garlic or onion pastes or salts. What we can have is the garlic oil and we can have the oniony flavour come through from chives or the green part of the spring onion. We've also got something called asafoetida powder and this, if anyone has smelt it or used it before in their cooking, it smells very much like onion and garlic. And you should be able to get that in um, big supermarkets as yes. well as you might find it in some ethnic food stores as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so beware of garlic in salad dressings and sauces, stock cubes, gravy, passata with the flavours, and crisps, so something like cheese and onion crisps. So it's really important to be checking the back of those packets. I've also noticed it before that, you know, sometimes garlic and onion won't naturally be listed in the ingredients. Yeah. It just says flavourings, doesn't it? It does. And that can be really confusing because actually that may mean onion and garlic, but you won't have it listed individually. So then we have the last on the list, so the pulses. So it, if absolutely necessary, so if you are vegetarian maybe, then you can have one portion of the following in a meal, but please ensure that the rest of the meal is really strictly low FODMAP. So you could have something like two tablespoons of canned chickpeas. You'll see that I've said canned here. You can also have two tablespoons of canned lentils or something like uh, green lentils. It's a smaller amount of one tablespoon. So what about the fibre? Because a lot of people worry on the FODMAP diet that they won't get enough fibre. And how important is fibre? Well, fibre is the main carbohydrate component of all plant foods and is not digestible and is found in whole grains, oats, fruits, vegetables, nuts and legumes. The fact that it's not digestible is, is important because that's what it helps move your stools through, through your bowels. So dietary fibre is vital in order to keep our guts healthy. It helps us feel fuller for longer nourishes our gut bugs so the gut bugs really love our fiber 
interferes with cholesterol production and keeps us regular. So it helps reduce our, our high levels of cholesterol. So fiber is really, really important. Fiber supplements can be helpful, but some fiber supplements can make IBS symptoms worse. And I'll show you the list in a minute. Different dietary fibers from different foods each have different benefits and affect our health in different ways. So supplements are not a replacement for the fiber that you find in food. So although some fiber supplements may be helpful, they're not a replacement for the fiber you get in food. A variety of fibrous fruits in your diet will work together to support your gut and your overall health. So really important that you do get fiber in your diet. And actually there is absolutely sufficient fiber that can be found uh, on the FODMAP diet. And this slide is from the Monash uh, Twitter app actually, which is fantastic, which just gives you um, some examples of different foods that you can have that are high in fiber. And I think it's really important to remember that once you've got the proper information on the FODMAP diet, there is no reason why you can't have sufficient fiber in your diet. These are some of the type of fiber supplements. The green ones are ones that are, are very good fiber supplements. And again, they don't replace the fiber you get in food, but they're good. Um, the resistant starch, the weak dextrins, not so great, and definitely not anything with Indian, FOSS, or GOSS, or wheat bran. Indian, FOSS, or GOSS are actually FODMAPs, and they're often added to things uh, like yogurts, for instance, and cereals, um, because they're actually helping to feed the gut bacteria. But of course, for a FODMAP patient, that may make things worse. So the green ones are fine, and not the others. Okay, so let's talk about lactose for a minute. So what I'm going to talk about is that this is not a dairy-free diet. So low lactose or dairy-free, that is the question some people ask. So what we will be telling you is that there are lots of low lactose products that you can use, and you can use some of the dairy-free ones as well, but it's not necessary. So you can see on this slide, we've got different brands of low lactose milk. So you've got the Arla, which is the lacto-free with the cow on the front but also some of the big supermarkets, Asda, Tesco, Aldi's, Sainsbury's. I think they all yeah. do them now, don't yeah, they? they all have their own version. And, they, and they, I think the, the significance of that cow on the front is to really show that it is ordinary cow's milk. You wouldn't taste the difference. If you put a glass of that in front of you, a glass of ordinary milk, you'd be very hard pressed to tell the difference. It is ordinary cow's milk, just like the milkman delivers to your door. It's just that they've taken the lactose out and put an enzyme lactase in to help you digest it. So really nice because it doesn't taste any different. You're not having a, a different type of milk. But as Kerry said, you can still have the nut milks, for instance, are fine. Is that correct? That is correct. So almond or hazelnut are absolutely fine to have. Um, there are no limitations. Um, you can also get low lactose, lactose-free yogurts. Again, lots of different brands out there for you to choose from. However, there are a few restrictions. So these alternative milks, your coconut mil milk would be less than 125 mils rice milk less than 200 mils however you can still eat you'll be pleased to hear chocolate and um, that would be less than 30 grams of ordinary chocolate uh, dark chocolate there would be no restrictions around you've got 50 mils of normal cow's milk two tablespoons of normal yogurt but your butter and your full fat cheeses are absolutely fine so things like parmesan uh brie camembert cheddar blue cheese cheddar they're all fine are they yeah, absolutely. Mm. And just looking there, 50 mils of milk. So if I was making myself a cup of tea, I could have normal cow's milk in that cup of tea if I just had a dash of it. Yes, Is that right? That's right. It's not a lot of milk, 50 mils. No. So, so a little dash of that. But if I was having, say, a milky coffee and was having more than 50 mils, I would need to go right with things like the lactose-free milk or yes. the nut milk. Yeah. That's so if you're right. at one of the coffee shops, I guess they quite often do things like soy milk or, or almond milk. So you'd want to go for one of the nut milks if they've got it, basically. Would, so, no yes. Yes. so something like the almond milk would be good. Yes. Okay. So if you suffer with regular diarrhea or loose stores, the low FODMAP diet would suggest the use of a low lactose diet. However, if you suffer with constipation, then you might not need to consider using the low lactose diet as part of this low FODMAP diet. It's very transferable, isn't it? In the sense that with our, our patients with uh, very loose stools, we always would add the low lactose element to the FODMAP diet. But actually, um, you would see diarrhea as one of the main, or very loose stools as one of the main issues. So if you've not got that, if constipation is your predominant problem, then it, it's really not necessary. Now, moving on to some foods that you can eat freely whilst on the low FODMAP diet. So here we've got a picture of all the protein foods that you're able to eat freely. So we've got things like your fish and your shellfish, um, all your meat, as well as gluten-free sausages. 
With the gluten-free sausages, you would just need to double check the ingredients to make sure there's no sort of onion or garlic flavoring within them. But sort of plain, unprocessed meat products are absolutely fine. Eggs are okay as well. We've got some of your vegetarian alternative products in there as well. So things like tofu, um, soya mince, corn mince is okay as well. Um, some of the other corn products are not appropriate for the low FODMAP diet because they often contain onion, garlic, or sort of a fungi in there, which is not a which is not appropriate for the low FODMAP diet. You've also got some things like nuts and seeds, which are a really good snack if you're on the low FODMAP diet. But with the nuts and seeds, you do need to limit it to a small handful per sitting, and you want to avoid both pistachios and cashews. We've also got a picture of all the oils, so all the kind of cooking oils that you might use, so whether it's sunflower oil, um, olive oil are absolutely fine. And we've also mentioned the benefits of maybe using garlic oil if you like the flavour of garlic. And lots of herbs and spices you've got down there. So most of your kind of green leafy herbs are fine, and things like your parsley, your chives, your fine, your organo, but also some of your spices in there. So you've got things like cinnamon, um, cardamom. The various ones there, yeah. nutmeg, uh, lots of them. Ginger's in there as well. Mm -hmm. So things like if you're used to cooking a stir fry, ginger can be quite a good flavour to use. Turmeric. Yeah, those things, all of those herbs are fine, aren't they? So other things that you can have as part of the low FODMAP diet, often we get ask questions about sort of things like sugar when it comes to, in cups of tea or in baking so normal table sugar and caster sugar is absolutely fine in terms of artificial sweeteners most of them are fine as long as they don't ex include the oils so the polyols so things which include things like mannitol or sorbitol or xenotol need to be avoided but all the art other artificial sweeteners are okay to use I've already mentioned that honey, which contains a lot of fructose, needs to be avoided. So alternatives for that might be things like maple syrup or golden syrup. So a question for you. So after what we've just talked about, is the low FODMAP diet an A, gluten-free, B, low in fructans, C, low in lactose, or D, dairy-free? Now, if we were to say pick two of those, what two parts make up the low FODMAP diet there? It would be the low in fructans and the low in lactose, wouldn't it? It's definitely not a gluten-free or a dairy-free diet. Absolutely. So up here now, we've just got an example of a daily menu. So if you embark on the low FODMAP diet, it's really helpful for the first you know, few weeks while you're getting used to what the diet involves, is actually to try and plan out what you're going to have. Plan out what you're going to have for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Make sure you've got those ingredients that you need in the covers, but also really important planning the snacks as well. Because when I see patients, that's often what captures them out, especially if they're used to going, if they're out of town, they're used to picking up foods every now and then um, to snack on. But if you know what your low format snacks are and you've planned them in for the day, that's really helpful as well. So this example for breakfast, you can either have something like porridge or cornflakes, rice krispies, with either your lactose-free milk or your milk alternative such as your nut milks. Or you might opt for something like the gluten-free toast with butter or with peanut butter on or some scrambled eggs. Lunch options, things like baked potatoes or gluten-free sandwiches with one of your local fat fillings would be fine. In terms of your dinner, any of the meat or fish is absolutely fine. You might include some of your starchy carbohydrates such as your rice or your potatoes. Um, gluten-free pasta would be an option as well. And as much of that low FODMAP vegetables that we've previously mentioned or your salads. Stir fries are a really good option if you're on a low FODMAP diet and you want a quick meal. So stir fries with the herbs and spices that we've discussed, as well as things like rice noodles as part of that meal. And like I mentioned, it's really important to include some of those snacks in your planning. So the low FODMAP fruit, so whether it's your bananas or your berries, um, gluten-free crackers or oat cake or rice cakes, a um, handful of nuts or seeds, some ready salted plain crisps, popcorn is another good one or things like homemade flapjacks. So um, if you're used to having something sweet in the house, sometimes people find it helpful to make a batch of homemade flapjack up, making sure they use it with, make it with gold and syrup rather than honey. Okay, so is the low FODMAP diet useful for patients with constipation? I've already touched on this when we were talking about the low lactose diet. So if you do find that constipation is an issue, what we're doing with the low FODMAP diet is actually taking away nature's laxatives. Um, so if you find that you are prone to constipation, then the below points will be helpful. But if you are removing these foods from your diet, 
um, you are more likely to become a bit constipated. So unless you take these following precautions. So number one, drink at least two litres of non-caffeinated fluid per day. So get that water in. Eating plenty of FODMAP safe fruit and veg. Eating plenty of the FODMAP safe grains. So as Marianne was talking about, your fibre. And taking some regular exercise. So, you know, maybe going out for a brisk walk every day. I, I have found patients come in, have you as well, when they've been doing the FODMAP, said, oh, I've never been constipated. No, I'm, I'm quite constipated now. So it is really common for people to get more constipated on the FODMAP diet. So as you're saying, Kerry, if you're already constipated, you could make it 10 times worse, couldn't you? Yes. So you really, really need to take those points into consideration. Have you found the same, Lee? Absolutely. And sometimes our talk through with a patient making sure they try that getting those things in place first before they actually embark on a low format diet so before they even start the low format diet they need to be making sure they are having at least two liters of fluid and they're having enough fiber and they're doing the exercise um, to make sure they've got that all in place before they actually embark on some of those dietary restrictions as part of the low format diet Okay, so just one question for you. So if you use the low FODMAP diet and you suffer with constipation, what would you need to be aware of? A, drinking at least one and a half to two litres of non-caffeinated fluid per day. B, eating plenty of FODMAP safe fruit and vegetables. C, avoiding all fruits and vegetables. D, eating plenty of FODMAP safe whole grains, rice, oats, nuts, seeds, whole grains, spelt, sourdough bread. Or E, taking regular daily activity exercise now you can pick more than one here so you would basically the only one that's not relevant is avoid all fruit and vegetables because that's the last thing you want to do yes, so even right. if the fruit and veg on the okay list are not ones you normally eat you must try and put them in your diet for your gut health so a b d and e are all absolutely correct is that right you are right we're just saying in terms of the fluid point of view is is actually making sure they people spend a bit of time actually figuring out how much they're actually drinking because when I speak to patients they're like oh yeah I drink two bottles of this bottle of water a day but they maybe fill it up when it's only halfway empty mm. so actually when you mm. actually figure out how much they're actually consuming it's maybe a little bit less than what they think. I often suggest to people that they get you know the um, plastic bottles you buy of sort of 500 ml bottles of water and refill those and put them in the fridge put four of them in the fridge and then try and have one with breakfast one with lunch and one with dinner and then the fourth one maybe throughout the day now of course if you're i mean i have patients who are drinking literally one small glass of water a day and that's all they've been having if they suddenly went up to two liters a day overnight they would be peeing all day long and be in all sorts of trouble so you must do it slowly so do it gradually increase that fluid gradually over three four five weeks um, so that you've got your fluid intake up and it's yeah it really important that you've got some sort of measure because you should quite rightly say often people think they've drunk more than they have well they'll say they've had you know six cups of tea yeah. a day but when yeah. you ask them how much their cup of tea they actually drink, drink it. yeah not absolutely. as much as they think yeah absolutely okay so gut bacteria we've mentioned the gut bacteria several times so far uh, and it is one of the um, criticisms about the FODMAP diet so I think it's really important that you know the background to this so FODMAPs are prebiotics and they encourage bacterial growth which is thought to be good for your health so we actually are taking away the very things that feed these bacteria um, so the FODMAP diet reduces some of the good bacteria like bifida bacteria so we don't want those reduced only use the diet for the treatment of IBS symptoms and not for any other reason unless you've been directed by your medical team to do so and reintroduce FODMAPs to a level of symptom control in order to encourage an increase in that gut bacteria again. So a lot of the research so, so far um, suggests that early on our bacterial levels may drop, which we don't want. What the research doesn't tell us yet is whether that happens in the long term. So after eight weeks on diet, is your bacteria still affected? But at the moment, we don't have those answers. So therefore, it's really, really important that you do reintroduce FODMAPs back into your diet so that you can get those bacteria back up to where they should be. There is a paper in 2016 by Staudacker where they actually did a very good randomized control study, and this was with King's College London, and they looked at using probiotics with the FODMAP diet, and it did appear to stop the reduction of the bacteria, but there isn't enough evidence yet to routinely suggest that everybody on the FODMAP diet should take a probiotic. So there isn't enough evidence yet, but there is this one paper so far which does suggest that possibly this might stop the bacterial changes. Um, but we need to keep a lookout for more research coming up. 
So how does the FODMAP diet affect nutritional status? Well, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, people are going to get malnourished. And, and indeed, if people do the diet on their own, they're much higher at risk of getting malnourished. But if they do it with a dietitian, the research shows actually you get a good level of nutrition across all food groups. Carbohydrate, energy and calcium might be reduced in the short term, but not in the long term. And calcium supplementation might be necessary in some patients. Now, that tends to be the patient's that for whatever reason are on a low dairy diet um, and maybe they don't like the lacto-free milk and they want to use one of the plant-based milks which doesn't have as much bioavailable calcium in it so it's it's something that really needs to be tailored for a particular person but if you're going to continue using all the lacto-free products and all the other dairy products then calcium supplementation should not be necessary the effect on nutrient intake and those self-implementing the diet is not known so as i said it's really important that you do it with advice from things like this uh, webinar where you've got proper specialist dietitians uh, from the proper apps with from King's College London uh, or going to see or and seeing a dietitian in person as well. So where to turn if you need help with the low FODMAP diet? So it can be very confusing so hopefully this webinar will have helped you already but you might want to know a bit more about what you can eat and where you can go for this help the Monash University Low FODMAP Diet app. So the Monash um, University have a blog which includes a recipe index. So if you go on to that link, it's a list of lots of different recipes for lots of different things, loads of breakfast recipes, vegetarian recipes, recipes for main meals, snacks, and it might just give you a little bit of inspiration about some of those recipes that you could cook whilst you're following the low FODMAP diet. But I'd also say the Monash um, Twitter app, even if you never do Twitter and you, you hate social media, if you only ever linked to that app, to that Twitter uh, account, it would be well worth your, your time because it has fantastic recipes and lots of really up-to-date information as well. Really, really good Twitter account. Absolutely, it's really good. Gives you lots of ideas, so they often have a, a tweet about these are some low mm. for good low format breakfast recipes or mm. dinner recipes etc or so, new yeah. foods because yeah. there are different manufactured foods now coming out aren't they that they're uh, they're uh, endorsing and mm -hmm. saying yeah, these would be good you know all sorts of new information and also new medical information that comes up they will put up for patients a very patient friendly app that twitter app i'd really highly recommend it but your point about putting the recipe uh, mention the recipe blog on their page is on their website page I think is, is a very good one. The other place you can find some help is our handouts so go to our website which was www.patientwebinars.co.uk and download the handouts. So like again we, we do advise you to re-watch this webinar several times if you haven't done so already go back and watch it again like maybe do it in separate chunks or watch it in one go. But don't forget there are two different low FODMAP diet approaches. So Leah talked about this earlier on. You've got the top-down approach, which is what we tend to do in clinics. This is restricting all FODMAP foods for a period of four to eight weeks. This is then restriction is then followed by reintroduction of these foods to find your personal level of tolerance. Um, we, we do emphasize that we are trying to return to as normalized diet as possible. And then you've got your bottom-up approach. So this is the reduction of a few FODMAP foods um, over a short period of time and then only further restriction if you haven't seen an improvement and it will be up to you to decide which of these you decide to do today. So in summary, the low FODMAP diet has absolutely nothing to do with allergy or the immune system. It's a simple factor of looking at the plumbing within the gut. The symptoms can be determined by a number of the FODMAP foods eaten in an individual meal or over sort of a short period of time. And it's about looking at your personal tolerance threshold to those FODMAP foods. I always think that actually it's interesting to think of it like a bit like a jug and you're filling up your jug with FODMAPs. And while the jug is filling up, you're not getting any symptoms. But as soon as that jug overflows, that's when your symptoms occur. So it may be that you had a piece of toast last week and you were absolutely fine. You have a piece of toast this week and suddenly you're in all sorts of trouble. And that might be because that piece of toast was the bit that overflowed that jug because you'd had an awful lot of FODMAPs that day and that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. So, yeah, so it's definitely about a tolerance threshold level, isn't it? Absolutely. And we've already mentioned some of the additional resources that you can use to help support you for the low FODMAP diet.
Remember the diet is for a maximum of eight weeks. So after those eight weeks, even if you're feeling a lot better, you do need to make sure you follow that reintroduction process. And that's essential in order to try and get some of those FODMAP foods back into the diet so your gut has the right bacteria to thrive. That reintroduction process helps you determine your personal threshold. And once you've known that, you know what foods you can tolerate being symptom free and able to improve that quality of life. Because I think it's a real hindrance of quality of life. Going out and eating and socialising can be a real pain when you're on a diet like this, can't it? So it's so important you reintroduce and get back a normal quality of life. Absolutely. And remember, you can either use the top down or the bottom up approach. And it may be that when you speak with your, a dietitian, they may be able to assess which one might be the most appropriate for you. And as I said, we would recommend, if possible, to try and use this webinar in conjunction with a specialist dietitian. The diet is not suitable for all conditions. So if you have any acute or chronic conditions which put you at risk of poor nutrition, nusatus, it may be that this diet is appropriate for you. So you should speak with a health professional before embarking on the low FODMAP diet. And for people with anxiety about food or, or a history of eating disorders, I would definitely take advice from your medical team before you embark on a diet like this. Absolutely. So if there is any anxiety related to food or, as you said, any sort of history of eating disorders, you do need to speak with a health professional before embarking on this diet. And it's really important that if the diet is successful after those eight weeks, you do need to follow that FODMAP reintroduction process and the instructions on how to do that are found on our website, patientwebinars.co.uk. And there's also a book that's recently come out by one of the specialist FODMAP dietitians, Lee Martin. So the book is called Rechallenging and Reintroducing FODMAPs, a self-help guide to the entire reintroduction phase of the low FODMAP diet. And you can get hold of that book online. I think it's on Amazon. I think okay. he said it's on Amazon. So yeah, very good. And we may in, in the future do a, a short webinar on reintroduction, but his book is fantastic. So it will really help. Yeah. And remember, if the diet is not successful, so you don't see any improvements in your symptoms following that restriction stage of the low FODMAP diet, it is vital that you stop the diet and you return to your normal eating pattern and reintroduce all those previously restricted foods back into your diet. Now, some questions to ask yourself if the diet does not help your symptoms. So the first question you want to ask yourself is, did you follow the diet strict enough for the set period of time? So sometimes we see people in clinic who say, I've tried the low FODMAP diet for a couple of weeks, it didn't work. Well, often for some people, it can take a couple of weeks to actually get the diet strict mm -hmm. enough because often, you know, as you go along, you learn about the low FODMAP diet a bit more, don't you? You find out yeah. the certain products you, you can and can't have. So sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to actually get you following the, the strict low FODMAP diet. Anyway, and I, I do, yeah, I find, I don't know about you, Kerry, but I have some patients who say within days they were feeling hugely better and other people it took six weeks. So it is very individual, isn't it? Yeah, so if you've tried the diet for a short period of time and it's not worked, you may want to consider it doing it for up to eight weeks and making sure you look back over your diet and make sure it is strictly low FODMAP. Another question to ask yourself is, have all other causes been ruled out, such as celiac disease? Now, we mentioned at the start that before you embark on something like the low FODMAP diet, you want to make sure you have had a proper diagnosis of IBS from a GP or gastro consultant, which may include excluding celiac disease. But if you've tried the diet and you are still suffering with those, some, those symptoms, and you know, especially some of those red flag symptoms, are such things like blood in your stools, unintended weight loss, sudden change in your symptoms, it may be that you might want to go back to your GP, discuss with them that you've tried the low FODMAP diet, it hasn't worked, discuss their symptoms, and they may then consider any alternative treatment options for you. I must say that the uh, the red flags like blood in stools, unintended weight loss, or or the fact that you know you've, your symptoms have suddenly changed, so perhaps you've had a history of constipation all your life, and suddenly you're getting diarrhea for no apparent reason those are all red flags and actually you should be going to see your GP about those before you even consider doing the FODMAP diet those are red flags they're things that need to be looked into and it may be absolutely nothing and uh, and not relevant to your health but it must be investigated first and it may be that your GP needs to send you to secondary care to see a gastroenterologist where they might do some investigations and just check that everything's okay so it or if you've got any of those symptoms, please do go and see your GP about them before you start the FODMAP diet. There's nothing to stop you doing the FODMAP diet while you're waking, waiting for an appointment to see a gastroenterologist, but you must go and see somebody if you've got those red flags. And, and the NICE guidelines say that you should be tested for celiac disease if you have IBS for longer than six months. So that should also be 
be, uh, be taken out of the equation because the symptoms are very similar. So in, certainly in Somerset, 22% of our, our celiacs were initially diagnosed with IBS. So it is really important you get that taken out of the equation as well. So in terms of the, the low FOMAP diet, it's particularly helpful when gut pain is the, one of the main problems. It's not so helpful if the symptoms you experience with IBS are caused by the overreaction to the stimuli such as stress or changes in the nerve methods are set between the brain and the gut. So as we've mentioned throughout, if you think that your, your IBS symptoms are more associated with stress and anxiety, it may be that the low FODMAP diet wasn't the treatment option for you, which was going to give you the most symptom relief. And therefore, you may want to look at some of those alternative treatments. It's also really important to look at your expectations. So even in the most successful cases, it's very unlikely that all the symptoms of IBS are going to disappear on the low FODMAP diet. You know, the low FODMAP diet, it's not a cure for IBS. It's purely a tool to help you manage your symptoms better by trying to reduce those symptoms to a more tolerable or comfortable level. So really we look, what we're looking at with the low FODMAP diet is to see an improvement in your symptoms. It's not necessarily looking at trying to get rid of them altogether. And finally, you know, you should be talking to your GP about getting a referral to a local dietitian, or if that's not available, you may want to look into a freelance private dietitian in your area, making sure that they have specialised in IBS and if appropriate, have the low FODMAP training. And when you see that dietitian, they're going to be able to assess how appropriate the low FODMAP diet is for you and provide you with any additional support that you may need. And also just a reminder that before you embark on the low FODMAP diet, you want to be making sure you have tried implementing the first line dietary advice for IBS first, which, as I said, can be found on our website. And also all the handouts that go along today's session can be found on the website patientwebinars.co.uk as well. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And uh, please don't forget that uh, we have a website, patientwebinars.co.uk, which is our NHS dietetic website.